Empirical provide compelling, interactive learning across a range of delivery options. Live on site, live online or online anytime, we have a training course that is ideal for you. For a no-obligations chat about your training requirements, contact us at empirical.com. As with the radio access network, the 5G core network is a new architecture. And in this session, we're going to consider what that architecture actually involves, starting off with PDU sessions and quality of service flows, We'll then consider the actual architecture and key components, and as part of that, network functions virtualization and also network slicing. So this is our high-level 5G system. We've already considered our new radio and our next generation radio access network, so our key focus here is the 5G core network. And this is a more detailed representation of that core network. Now this is the reference point representation where we see our various core network elements connected up with different network reference points. Now the first thing that we're actually going to pick out from this diagram is actually the user plane connectivity and that user plane connectivity in 5G is called a PDU session, a protocol data unit session and you can see it runs from the mobile or from the device through the GNB to the UPF, the user plane function and then on to the data network. So traditionally in LTE, for example, it would be called the packet data network. In 5G, it's the data network. But this is going to be the internet or perhaps the IMS or a corporate LAN of some description. So no other devices in the network will be using the connectivity associated with this particular PDU session. Now, in order to provide QoS, within our PDU session, we have what are called QoS flows. Now, a QoS flow is effectively a flow of user plane traffic which will be receiving a particular level of quality of service. Now, because we might have traffic with different QoS requirements, what that might mean is within the PDU session, there are several QoS flows actually in operation. To distinguish between them, each QoS flow has a QoS flow ID. And to begin with, we will have, if you like, a default QoS flow. And this default QoS flow, it will have a particular level of quality of service, but it won't have any kind of packet filtering on it, so all packets can potentially go down this QoS flow if necessary. However, as soon as we start adding additional QoS flows with different QoS requirements and different QoS levels, then we will start filtering which traffic can actually go down these bearers. So you can see that in actual fact, within a PDU session, we could have several QoS flows in existence. And you can see that the kind of QoS flow characteristics we see for quality of service are things like latency, priority, and whether or not this particular QoS flow is guaranteed bitrate or non-guaranteed bitrate. And as appropriate, these flows can be transient, so we can actually remove flows if necessary. Now, being realistic about this, if the data network was the internet, for example, then we typically only need one QoS flow. That would be the default flow, and that would be a best effort QoS flow. If, however, this is maybe 5G voice services, and the data network is the IMS, then we could have a QoS flow that's carrying the signaling associated with voice, and then we'd have a separate QoS flow that's carrying the actual voice packets themselves. And as traffic traverses the QoS flow, it actually has a QoS flow ID added to the traffic protocol stack. So we know exactly which flows a particular piece of data should go down. But certainly to have lots and lots of QoS flows, well, we'd really need to consider what scenario would actually require that. 
As we move on to our actual architecture though, we'll look at each of these various elements in turn now, all fundamentally designed to keep that PDU session active for the subscriber and ensure that fundamentally the PDU session follows them as the subscriber moves around the network. So to begin with, the first element that we're going to consider that we find in the core network is the core access and mobility management function. And this has got a similar role to the MME in LTE, whereby it looks after mobility management. So in terms of subscriber mobility, we consider the fact that this AMF will always know either the tracking area that the subscriber is in or the potential cell that they're in. And it really depends on whether the subscriber is idle or connected, respectively. The AMF, though, also plays a key role in security and registration. So it's the AMF that will be liaising with various other subscriber databases to ensure that the subscriber is allowed on the network in the first instance and the AMF will play a key role in authenticating that subscriber within the network. Finally, the AMF will also provide the device with a temporary identity which you can use whenever it signals the network. That temporary ID is also used in paging as well. So that's the core access and mobility management function. Moving back to our architecture, the next element is the session management function. So traditionally in LTE, it would be the MME that does mobility management and session management. We can see that in 5G, that functionality has actually been split. So it's the AMF that does mobility management and here the session management function does session management. So what we're effectively talking about here is the establishment and the modification and the teardown of our PDU sessions. So the SMF is directly involved in that and as part of that it will be routinely liaising with the policy control function to determine whether or not a particular user data session is allowed to go ahead. Not only that, the session management function is directly involved with the establishment of the actual PDU session connectivity. So that pipe that we draw on our diagram, which is representative of the PDU session, is actually a series of separate connections that must be set up in the network. Now, those connections run through the user plane function, and it's the job of the SMF to choose which UPF, and also, if the data session is IP based, the SMF will also be allocating an IPv4 or an IPv6 address. Now I did say if, because PDU sessions can actually be based on purely Ethernet or even unstructured data in 5G. It's not all about IP like it was in LTE. As we move through the network, we've got our user plane function. We've already started to touch on this. And as you can see, it is an anchor point for NG RAN mobility. So as I move around the radio access network, I will move from one GNB to another. But the UPF will remain that anchor point into the network. So the user plane connectivity will always be running from the GNB to our UPF in the core network. And because the UPF is directly sat on the user plane, it's an ideal point to enforce quality of service. That's ensuring that the right data is sent down the correct QoS flow, and also implementing policy as appropriate. And that could be throttling of data, for example. As we move through the network, the next element that we have is the UDM, and this is Unified Data Management. In effect, it's a central repository of subscriber information, directly involved with access authorization because it will be holding security keys. It's also involved in registration and mobility management because it will be tracking where our subscriber is attached to in terms of which AMF our subscriber is being allocated. And then finally, it will contain the data network profile or profiles. It effectively contains the subscriber profile, telling entities like the AMF and the SMF 
exactly what our subscriber is and is not allowed to do, which data networks they can connect to, and what kind of QoS profile they can expect to be granted when they do connect to those data networks. Next in line and finally is the PCF. And the PCF is there to implement policy control, a policy control function. And when we talk about the PCF and implementing policy control, it's all on a dynamic basis. Now, the dynamic policy decisions are based on conditions that might be active in the network at this time. So before we just blindly set up a PDU session to a particular data network, the SMF, for example, will check in with the policy control function to determine if, at this present time, are there any network conditions that are going to influence how our subscriber experiences their service. So it might be that the fact the subscriber is in a particular geographical location, and because they are in that particular cell, for example, the PCF determines that the subscriber needs to be throttled at this time, or maybe isn't even allowed to get PDU session connectivity. So the PCF on a dynamic basis has got the ability to alter both mobility and session related service aspects. So it does play a big part in the overall ecosystem. Now notice when we go back to our main diagram, the PCF does have connectivity into the data network as well. So that PCF can take session related information such as our subscriber is trying to make a phone call it can take that information, send it into the 5G core network to ensure that the correct resources are established. Now, the title of this particular slide is Network Functions Virtualization because what is key for our 5G core is that in reality, much of these nodes will actually be virtualized as part of the NFE infrastructure. Now, what do we mean when we say virtualize? Well, effectively, these devices that we see are not standalone devices. What they are are software processes running on what's termed a commercial off the shelf server. And this is intrinsically the network functions virtualization architecture, whereby we see our virtualized devices, whether it's control plane, potentially user plane, subscriber management, billing and policy control, they can all run as software processes, maybe with a slight exception of the UPF, there's an added complexity to the user plane, but certainly from a control plane perspective, these elements can run as software processes, and the idea behind network functions virtualization is you have a network functions virtualization infrastructure, which is fundamentally there to provide these software processes with the compute, the storage and the network resources that they will all undoubtedly require. But the key facet is the NFE infrastructure is a shared infrastructure that all of these software processes will actually use. And it's all built on commercial off-the-shelf hardware. So the cost savings or the potential cost savings to deploying the core network based on an NFE infrastructure are significant. Now, one of the key benefits of this, other than financial, is the flexibility that you have in your network. Because these processes are running as software processes, if we need to scale up or scale down capacity, it's much more straightforward in a virtualized environment. So if we need more AMF capacity, for example, well, if it's a traditional AMF deployed as a piece of hardware, then actually implementing a new AMF in the network can take weeks or even months. Whereas if it's a virtualized AMF, well, scaling up capacity could be a matter of minutes. But crucially, you need what's called MANOR, management and orchestration to facilitate all of this. So this is a piece of the infrastructure in and of itself. So fundamentally, this is actually what the 5G core will look like. It's a series of virtualized elements. And what's crucial is traditionally, where we see protocols being exchanged between our core network elements in networks like LTE and, and earlier technologies, in 5G, this is all API-driven, application programming interfaces. 
these virtualized devices, these virtualized elements, are sending API calls to one another in order to communicate. Now, the final consideration for this session, which is actually closely related, or maybe an enabler for network slicing. So NFE is a key enabler for this notion of network slicing, but what exactly is network slicing? Well, network slicing effectively allows the service provider to create, if you like, logical networks across a common physical infrastructure. Now, if you recall, 5G is not just about providing huge data rates to the subscriber. 5G is about becoming an enabler network for lots and lots of different applications and lots and lots of different third-party users of the network and the common example is the Internet of Things. So you need to be able to create a very adaptive, flexible network that will provide different customers, different third parties with different features. And network slicing is a perfect solution to do this because we can create these logical networks across the same 5G physical infrastructure. So we ultimately provide that flexibility to accommodate lots and lots of different potential service environments. So to illustrate, there's our 5G RAN and our 5G core network. We might have, for example, a V2X network slice, and clearly the characteristics of V2X are low latency, critical communication. Now on top of the same physical infrastructure, we could have voice services for our typical human subscribers. We need low latency for our voice and signaling, and we need guaranteed quality of service. And finally, we might have some kind of smart metering network slice, where we need to accommodate large numbers of connected devices, but they have actually fairly low data requirements and relatively minimal network connectivity and activity, potentially. So lots and lots of different environments here that can be accommodated by network slicing. And in terms of the standards, in actual fact, an individual device is able to connect to up to eight network slices simultaneously. So in summary then, we talked to begin with about PDU sessions and we saw that they provide connectivity between the device and the data network. Within a PDU session, we have QoS flows and they are designed to provide specific levels of quality of service for specific types of data running down them. We talked about the 5G core network. We talked about five of the key elements, namely the core access and mobility management function, the session management function, the user plane function, unified data management, and then finally the policy control function. We talked about how all of these elements will fundamentally be virtualized and a key benefit to virtualization is really opening the network up to network slicing. Need to know more? Why not visit our store where you can choose from over 200 hours of video-based training? Alternatively, you can contact us to discuss any specific training requirements you may have.